Great. Uh, welcome everyone to another Walker webcast. Uh, this is a uh, unique one in that we are recording this on a Tuesday for replay on a Wednesday because my guest today is on the other side of the world uh, covering the Australian Open. Uh, Jim Courier, uh, let me do a quick bio on you, JC, and then we'll dive into my questions for you. Uh, James Spencer Courier, born August 17th, 1970, is a former number one world tennis player. He won four major titles, two at the French Open and two at the Australian Open. He was the youngest man to reach the finals of all four Grand Slam singles tournaments at the age of 22 years and 11 months old. He also won five Masters 1000 series titles and 23 career titles. Since 2005, he has worked as a tennis commentator, notably for the host broadcaster of the Australian Open as an analyst for the Tennis Channel. He is also founder and CEO of Inside Out Sports, which among other things, puts on the annual Champions Tour. Before I dive into my discussion with Jim, I need to give a quick shout out to the dudes, Millsy, Burt, Bobby C, Johnny Mack, and Jay Bird, along with Jace, OB, and JV, who have all been wonderful friends to Jim and me over the years and play a large role in both of our lives. Um, okay, JC, um, how's Australia? Well, first of all, greetings from Wednesday. I'm your time traveling companion here. It's already Wednesday morning where I am. So it's about 10 in the morning here. Uh, I'm in Melbourne and uh, it's beautiful here as it always is this time of the year. It's, uh, I would say it's it's bizarre, Wills, the, um, the streets of Melbourne. This time last year when we were here, there was no COVID in Australia. We all had to go quarantine for, for 14 days and then we could come out and things were relatively normal no masks, everyone was living, restaurants were full, people were in offices, and it's a ghost town now that they've uh, moved to a live with COVID policy instead of a zero COVID policy. So it's very strange. It's really weird to be here. You know, Melbourne is a big, big metropolitan city, and it's like it's a public holiday every day here. It's really, really strange, but the tennis is sort of a bright spot uh, for the Australians and, and certainly for me. Can't talk about COVID in the Australian Open without getting your take on the Novak Djokovic, uh, I would call it saga. Uh, it's now over. Uh, you were right there watching it all unfold. Um, what's your take on, everyone seems to be wanting to find somebody to blame on this thing. I think it's just a super unfortunate situation about him heading down there and then getting turned away. But what's the, what's the take on the ground down there? Yeah, look, I think everyone understands that he's made a, a conscious decision not to get vaccinated and everyone has that right, their body, their choice, but it's not without consequences. He's now seeing that the consequences may not just be here in Australia because uh, Paris and Roland Garros, which is the next major, has, they've just announced that vaccinations will be required to be in the stadium for both players and fans. So. You know, this this is going to be a rolling issue for him if he chooses to continue to be unvaccinated, uh, which would be a shame. But again, his body, his choice, not without consequences. So we start with that. Uh, then we move forward. Um, in November, the Australian Sports Ministry and, and the people in the state of Victoria announced that, that there, there were going to be no exceptions, had to be vaxxed to play. And then they opened a, a, a side door for medical exemptions. And, and we understand that those are, are meant for people who, you know, have... Uh, uh, problems with the vaccine that they might have allergies to or, or, or various issues like that. But there was another side door that got opened up that Novak was able to exploit, at least temporarily, and that was to get in if he'd had COVID in the last six months. And he got COVID on December 16, which is very late. And that, uh, that allowed him to be given this medical exemption. So look, that should have never happened. You know, that medical exemption should have only been for people who have allergy issues or some sort of a serious medical condition that would prevent them from having COVID. So we start with that. That's a mistake that was made by the government. Tennis Australia, here, here's the way I see it. Novak did what he could do within the rules to come to play. His, his motives were always clear. He wanted to play. He was gonna use the rules to his advantage if he could get in. He did that and he was given a visa, all right? He was given a medical exemption. He doesn't get to create those. He doesn't get to decide on those. He just applies for those. So I'm not sure we can blame him for getting on the plane. Uh, Tennis Australia, their job, our friend Craig Tiley, who's the CEO, his job is to try and help the players and to get them in to, to run the tournament. And, and he, he did what he was supposed to do as far as 
making things available for all of the players, not just Novak. There were two other people amongst the playing group that were given that same medical exemption, and they both got into the country without problem. In fact, one of them played a tournament the week prior to Novak being stopped. Uh, she has since left the country once this whole thing blew up. So that leaves us with the government and the state government here in Victoria and the federal government. Uh, you know, they're the ones who get to make the rules uh, and border control is controlled by the federal government. So ultimately for me, this is probably the left hand not talking to the right hand at the government level. And there, there certainly needs to be some accountability for this. But I, for the life of me, and maybe I'm conflicted because I'm from the playing group and the tournament side, and I'm not a government official, but I, for the life of me, cannot see how uh, anyone but the government is to blame for their borders. Um, so that that's where I sit on it. It's, it's been awful, it's been terrible for the tournament. And um, of course, it could have all been avoided if Novak had gotten vaccinated. But, you know, again, that, that's not something he seems to want to do. What's your take on it? If you, hey, Val, if you were a betting man, would you think that he plays the French? Thankfully, I'm not a betting man. Um, <laughs> that, that's a tough call. You know, effectively, in the short term, he's doing serious harm to his legacy if he's not able to play, right? Because he, he is the dominant player still today, and he has a chance to add to his uh, already, you know, sparkling credentials. And, and if, if this is where his career kind of, if he chooses to die on the vine on this issue, that, that's going to be a remarkable story in, in the, the rearview mirror. It's happening in real time. And one thing we know about Novak, he's incredibly, incredibly uh, determined and dogged, and he is a fighter, and especially when he has his back up against the wall. He loves to play against a big crowd. This is a, a pretty big crowd of people who want him vaccinated out there in the world. So it, it's a tough one. I, I, I'd say it's a coin flip, honestly. You know, But things could change. But maybe we move from a pandemic to an endemic. And then borders open up and people aren't as concerned about unvaccinated participants. We'll see. Do you think with Novak out, Jim, that if either Roger or Rafa win either in Australia or this coming summer, that there's an asterisk next to them becoming the all-time Grand Slam winner with him being out of the picture? Or do you think it's viewed as that's it? They're number well, one. Yeah, look, I think short term, some people might. Uh, attribute an asterisk to it, but players miss tournaments all the time. Roger's not here because his knees, he's had four surgeries on it. Rafa's missed many majors because of injury. So uh, in, in the, the the big view, when you pull back from frame and look at their careers in their totality, I, I think this will be a, a blip as far as how their achievements are viewed. It's not going to be a blip as far as how Novak is viewed. This will be a part of his his uh, you know biography for the rest of his life. This is a massive international story, but I think it's not an asterisk as far as I'm concerned because players miss tournaments all the time. And when you think about those three in comparison to all the other great tennis players of all time, um, who's the GOAT? Well, on, uh, on statistics alone, uh, Novak has a clear edge. He, he's tied with them with the metric that a lot of people consider the most important. As you pointed out, the majors, they all have 20 at the moment. But if you dive a little deeper, he has a head-to-head -head winning record against both Roger and Rafa. He's won all four of the majors at least twice. None of them have done that yet. He has the most weeks at number one, which is really important. He has the most year-end number ones. He just got past Sampras. He's at seven, uh, and, and Sampras is at six. So, you know, I, I look at all of the metrics that are relevant uh, in black and white that are not emotion-based, and there's no doubt that if everything stopped today, he's the best He's had the best career, yeah, but some people get emotional, uh, understandably, because they're passionate about these athletes and, and the, the, you know, people will make a hard case for for the overall picture. And, and some people will put this thing down here in Australia as a negative when you consider that. I've already seen that argument made by fellow players, uh, retired players. So, look, I, I'm much more black and white and I try and take the emotion out of this discussion, but I know a lot of people can't. And on that same question, as it relates to the, the women, um, fair to say that Serena has surpassed both Martina and Steffi as the greatest female player of all time? Yeah, I think that's fair. And I, you know, look, I think Margaret Court has the all-time majors uh, record, male or female, with 24. But you have to factor in that she won a lot of those in the Australian Open when, when it wasn't well attended. And uh, so I think you have to look at the Open era. And from that standpoint, you give Serena the edge over Steffi. And, uh, you know, Steffi had 22 majors and then Martina and Chrissy 
had 18 each playing at the same time. So, you know, that that's sort of the canon of the greatest uh, female players of the open era. And I think that's kind of the best way to look at it. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping Serena is able to get back out like Roger. We haven't seen much of her lately, hoping that her health will allow her uh, to get back out and keep pursuing her, her on-court dream. But, you know, she, she's an entrepreneur. She's got a lot going on off court too. We're, we'll, we'll hear a lot from Serena the rest of her life outside of the lines, uh, but hoping she gets back in there before too long. Speaking about outside the lines, I'm assuming you've seen the movie King Richard. I have. What'd you think about it? I thought it was great. First of all, it's really, really difficult for tennis to be portrayed well on screen, just as far as the actual shot making. So that part was really, really well executed. Uh, and I love the storyline. I love that they start, they ended the story at the beginning of their careers. I mean, that that's such a, an interesting uh, way to, to present their unbelievable story. Um, Will Smith was amazing. I thought as Richard, we all know Richard within the sport. He is, uh, he is a real character, a really bright guy who had a vision and he executed on it and he's complicated. And they, they portrayed a lot of those complications. Was it a little puffier? I mean, of course, when you have the family executive producing it, they're going to sand down some edges that, that everyone has in their lives. But it was, uh, I thought it was a really, um, I thought it was a really interesting inside look to family dynamics and, and dream pursuing and sacrifices made and, and all those things that people that tend to excel um, go through. So you had those dreams as a junior tennis player growing up in uh, North Florida, actually where I am today. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about life before you headed off to the Nick Bolletieri Tennis Academy. You were a baseball player and a tennis player and a very good baseball player, as I recall. Um, what was it that made you uh, give up the diamond and uh, head towards the court? Yeah, so I, can't, I came from Dade City, Florida, which is a small town in central Florida and, uh, you know, played Little League Baseball, played soccer. My parents played social tennis. And as a result, my sister and I would, would follow them along and hit against the, the racquetball wall. And that's sort of how I fell for the sport. And then I fell into it. My parents started entering me in tournaments because I loved playing it. And, and one thing you have to remember when we were growing up, Wills, uh, unlike today, there was a real seasonality to sports. You didn't play baseball year round or football year round the way that kids or lacrosse year round, the way that kids can now. It's, it was a spring sport baseball. And then I had a lot of free time to fill and, and I wanted to play sports. It was fun. So tennis was where I, I spent my time away from the diamond or the soccer field. And, and then uh, at 13, I had to make the call uh, because it was sort of a, was a binary situation of I was going to pursue baseball or I was going to pursue tennis. And in tennis at that stage, they and they still have this, they had ranking systems. So you knew where you stood uh, relative to your peer group, not only in your state, but also in the nation. Baseball at that point didn't offer that. So you had no way to judge if you were good or not, really, um, other than your local competition. So pretty easy call for me to make. I had a good national ranking in tennis and that's when I put the uh, the bat and the glove down and, and went all in on the racket. You play tennis as a righty, but you play golf as a lefty. When you were playing baseball, did you hit lefty and throw righty? Absolutely. And then here's the weirdest thing about me. I also, I write right-handed. I'm right arm dominant, but I kick left-footed too. I, I've met a lot of people who, we actually have a lot of tennis players who throw right, hit left, or play their opposite uh, hands in, in golf or baseball. Andre Agassi hits left, play, plays golf left. Marty Fish, a great golfer, does that. Lendl, you know, Laver is a lefty who plays golf righty. So that's not unusual, but they all kick with their dominant uh, side. I don't, I, I'm, a, I'm a little screwed up. You know that all too well. <laughs> you can hit the hell out of a golf ball. That I can assure anyone listening to this. Yeah. Um, so had you won the Orange Bowl before heading to Bolletary or did you go to Bolletary and then win the Orange Bowl? So the Orange Bowl was a, at, at that stage, it was sort of the, the biggest international junior tournament. And I got to the finals in the 14 and unders. And that was really the turning point for me as far as getting to, getting on the radar of Nick Bolletari, who had one of two tennis academies in existence at that point. And they were both thankfully located in central Florida. His was in Bradenton. So I, I made the finals. I lost in the finals, but I got the call. Um, you know, Nick's guys called up our house. They just, you know, we had phone books back then. They just called our house and, offered a scholarship and, and I was unbelievably grateful and excited to, uh, I mean, literally, you know, I dropped out of public school, joined a private school that Nick set up for me, you know, days later, I was there and just foaming at the mouth, ready to go. 
So what was it like arriving at Boletari where you're there with, at that time, the world's, I mean, there, there was, I don't know if there's any comparable in today's world, but back then, I mean, if you were at Boletari, that was, that was it. That was where the world's top juniors were playing. You were there, Andre was there. Um, and what was, I mean, that had to have been quite something to just be admitted in, but when you arrived, what were the other players like to you as far as, I mean, if you go to a basketball camp, you get put on a team and you got four teammates who you're all trying to win and show off. When you show up somewhere like Boletari in an individual sport, it's, you know, sort of a dog eat dog world of trying to be the number one there. What was it like to both be admitted and at the same time showing up as a competitor to all the other kids? Yeah, it was an interesting dynamic. You, you frame it really well, Willie. Uh, I also started in January. So I didn't come in at the beginning of a school year where there were a lot of new faces that would be joining in September. So I came into an area where everyone sort of made their friends. They had their cliques. There were 130 of us, uh, about 100 boys, about 30 girls, all you know, various stages of primarily high school, some a little younger. And you, you try to fit in. Now, I knew most of the people in my age group because we played the same junior tournament. So I knew them. They were my peer group. They were, in many cases, friends, but in all cases, competitors as well because of the nature of our sport. So I got thrown into a room with seven other guys. Andre was one of those guys. So there, it's a two-bedroom condo with you know, four bunk beds in, in each room. And, and you know, they were, they, they were already kind of dug in, if you will. So I was the outsider, and I had to uh, throw elbows to make some space and try and find space on the court as well and get Nick's attention. It was unbelievably competitive. It was amazing because now I'd gone from training at home um, you know, basically scrapping and scrounging and driving everywhere, having my mom drive me everywhere to find good practice after school to now go into a half day of school and then just being on the court or in the gym or on the track and training like a professional, which was incredible. And, and it was a fast track. It was it was really something. And did you know at that time, Jim, that um, sort of your athleticism was going to be the differentiator in the sense that you had obviously amazing strokes and you were an amazing tennis player. But as you moved into your pro career, it was very clear that your athleticism is what differentiated you from the rest of the pack. Did you know at that age that that was the differentiator? No, I didn't. Because again, the pond was getting it was getting bigger and it was getting deeper when I went to Boletarius because now at this stage, it's not just a national uh, group of players. We had international players like Goran Ivanisevic, who was also coming in. And, and he also had professionals like Aaron Krikstein and Yannick Noah and Carling Bassib, you know, top 10 players training there. So you got a, a view of what it was really like at the top. And, and while I knew my tennis game was pretty good, you know, it wasn't clear that I was going to be more athletic. Um, and, and I would argue with you that I wasn't. I, I'd say if, if we did a an NFL combine, for example, um, of the players at Boletari's, I would have tested on the higher end of the scale, but I wasn't off the charts. There would have been better raw athletes, but that's what's interesting about sport. And it's sort of macro macro view down to, you know, it's not always the smartest. It's not always the fastest. It's not, you know, they're not always the ones who get to the top of the food chain. There, there are lots of X factors. And I think one of my strengths was I had some of those X factors. I had guts. I wasn't afraid of big moments, red light moments. I call them when the cameras are on. I, I didn't, that didn't bother me. I actually enjoyed it. And I wasn't afraid to fail. And that, that was the biggest one. I wasn't afraid to fail. I was going to leave it all out there. And if it wasn't enough, that was okay. And there, there's a, a wall for some people that they just are not willing to scale, which is the failure wall. And uh, it's comfortable on the other side of that one for them. And that was just by nature of how I was raised, that was never uh, an obstacle for me. I was just going to say, I think a lot of that has to do with your mom and dad and the family structure that you had behind you as it relates to, yeah. um, I've been asked a lot of times as it relates to how I became such a great entrepreneur. And first of all, I don't consider myself a very entrepreneurial person. Uh, and as people pushed me on that topic, they said, well, you've taken lots of risks. You went down to Latin America and started an airline. You've done this, you've done that. And one of the things that I always had in the back of my mind as I went to Latin America and did various things was that if all hell broke loose, I could still go home, have caring parents, have a hot meal, and I could kind of read, you know, I could restart, if you will. And I, uh, I, it would appear to me as if 
when I think about Boletari at that time, a lot of kids um, were there that tennis was their only thing. That was like all it was. And they had a lot of pressure on them to succeed. Whereas while you were fantastic and incredible at it, you were there at your desire. And if you decided you weren't going to do it, your parents were still going to say, come on home and figure out what the next step's going to be. Uh, that's, that's really well put. And that's really accurate, Willie. My parents really stressed effort over, over results. And, and I think that gave me that soft landing available to, to fail. And um, I wasn't, I also wasn't someone that my parents said, oh, you're destined for greatness. You're, you're an amazing athlete, this, that, and the other. They were just focused on, on more of the day-to-day, -day, you know, try and be a good person, try to behave in a way that will be proud of you and do your best. And eventually good things will happen as opposed to some other of my peers who had all these expectations placed on them that, that they were destined for greatness. And, and if, and in that, in the subtext of that is it, is if you don't become great, you're a failure. And that was, I was never propositioned with what failure for me would look like other than a lack of effort. And I also ultimately knew that the tennis would be a conduit for something good in my life in a way that, you know, my, my father was a, a baseball pitcher at the university of Florida. And that's how he got his start in his world was getting a scholarship. And I knew that I was at a good enough level to get a scholarship. And my, my parachute was going to be a free ride to a good college that would then set me up for something else in life. And I was also learning skills that would allow me, I, I would think to, to be a successful business person and a successful teammate um, in, a, in an operation because I had work ethic and I had discipline and, and, uh, and I had ethics in general because tennis, you have to call your own lines and, and you know, cheaters are widely known in the community and that's not a good thing to be considered a cheater. So there's all these lessons that you learn and, and you know, the, there's the macro and the micro and all of it congeals. But I, I saw plenty of, of players who had these expectations that weighed them down. I, I was lucky not to have that because my parents did an amazing job with, with me and my siblings. So one of the first matches where, if you will, the expectation was that you were going to lose uh, was you against Andre 1989 French Open, where you are both the two Nick Politeri protégés. You go to Paris and the two of you go head to head. Huge day for the Politeri Tennis Academy of having the two of you yeah. play. Um, Nick is sitting in Andre's box, not in your box. Um, talk for a moment about walking out on the court and seeing your coach sitting in your opponent's box rather than in some sort of mid-court seat and yeah. what that did to drive you that day. Sure. Well, let, let, let me give it a little, even a fuller picture than that, because I was training at Nick's. Uh, I was traveling with one of Nick's coaches, a guy named Sergio Cruz, had been assigned to me and was traveling with me on the tour. So I was part of the Nick staple and, and I spent time with Nick. He was sort of the master coach and then Sergio was the day-to-day -day coach, but you know, Andre was high profile and that was a, a big part of Nick's strategy was to use the pr promotion of being out on tour with Andre and, and some of us as well to help promote the Academy and drive business to the Academy. So I didn't, I mean, I was a kid, right? I was 19. I was super focused on myself as, as most athletes and most 19 year olds tend to be. I didn't have a, a view of, of Nick's lens at all. So I was deeply hurt when I walked onto the court and I saw Nick sitting in his box. I didn't anticipate that. It was a gut punch. It was motivating, it fired me up. I, it wasn't like I didn't want to win the match anyway. You know, Andre and I'd had some battles on tour already at that point. And um, I was able to, to win on that day. It was actually a, a match that happened over two days. So I even had more time to, to let the fire burn overnight after the match got called for darkness and we had to resume the next day. But it, it was a fork in the road for me. Nick did me a favor in many ways. He, made, he did me so many favors. Uh, and, and we certainly are, are very good friends today. We bridged that gap um, after I grew up and understood life a little bit more. Um, but it was it was a fork in the road and I left immediately after that tournament, I packed up my stuff and, and went my own separate ways. Uh, and it was a time to grow up in a way and, and leave the nest. And so Nick, uh, he, he regrets it since, but ultimately he, he did me a favor. So fast forward from there, two years later, July of, no, not July, it'd be June, June of 1991. Um, you and Andre back at it, yeah. finals of the French Open. Um, you're down. And there's a rain delay. 
uh, you go in, you keep your thoughts on what you need to do, and you come back out and you win the fourth set 6-1, fifth set 6-4, and you end up being the 1991 French Open champion. Um, I've watched that match a thousand times. I've watched you drop to the ground when you win. Um, to those of us who have absolutely no idea what it's like to be there on center court at a grand slam when all of a sudden it's all happened, try and what's, I mean, to try, what's that feel like? I mean, seriously, like you're there, you've, you've Does, is it an out of body experience? You've had that feeling and, I, and I'll, because I've had, I've only had it a few times in my life, but I would imagine most people listening to this will have had that feeling. And it's the same feeling you have when your, your child is born. It's, it's mind blowing. It's overwhelming. It's endorphins. It's adrenaline. It's surreal. And it's hard to capture that moment because everything is just flying by you at like you're, you know, at warp speed. So, um, you know, it's a life changing moment. And the only thing I can compare it to is, is childbirth. That's it. You know, my life changed on that day. I fell to the ground in disbelief. And all those dreams that, that, that you have as a child, they sort of come together in one moment and, and winning majors after that felt great too, but it didn't feel anything like that because I already had experienced that breakthrough, right? It's like piercing a, a veil that you didn't know what was on the other side of the wall. You finally get to see it. So it was surreal. It was um, overwhelming. And the next 48 hours were an absolute blur before the adrenaline finally came out of my body. And I went, oh. Oh yeah, Wimbledon's about 10 days away. I better get my stuff together and kind of get ready to go again. But it was awesome. It was amazing. And and uh, you know, the only the, we're all lucky if we're lucky enough to have kids to have moments like that where, where we we ultimately see our lives change. So at that moment, and you said it took 48 hours for the adrenaline to get out of your body. Mm -hmm. Talk for a money moment, Jim, about what it's like that for all practical purposes up until then you were going at the world and now the world is going at you. That's How do you deal at the age of 20 years old with the onslaught of attention and press yeah. and sponsors and potential coaches and everything that came at you so quickly? So let's frame that in today's terms comparatively. It's a great question. What happens when your world changes? So in today's terms with social media and just the, the effect that every single tennis match is now televised or streamed, there, there's so much more attention and focus um, and opportunity as a result of that from a commercial standpoint for these players. And it's gotta be daunting for them and because they can't go anywhere without being videoed or photographed. And that was not a world that I inhib inhabited in 1991. I could still, sort of close the doors and get away. Um, but it for the first time, now people were coming at me, seeing me as something that, that they wanted to be around for commercial reasons primarily. Um, and it was different uh, for sure. And, and you have to hold your friends and family close and, and know why people want a piece of you and be wary of that. Now, it's not that you're not gonna, you know, you're, you're gonna meet really great people. I met you after I'd had that, that moment of fame. It's not that it's preventative from finding genuine friends, but you've got to be able to, to sift through them and you got to be able to compartmentalize. And, and one thing that I also came to understand, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing for someone to know uh, or to help someone who goes through that transformative moment is that by and large people that come into the public eye you're renting a space, you don't own it. And in a tennis, the space that I was renting was, was a, a space of a very highly ranked tennis player who could now do things for people. I could now sell tickets. Uh, I could now sell shoes and rackets. And that was different. I was commoditized and, I was, and I'm grateful for it. And it's allowed me a great life as a result, but I also had to you know, compartmentalize that aspect of it and make sure that I knew who my true, true friends and core group of people around me were. And, and hold them dear, and then not lose sight of the fact that I still had to execute. So uh, I still had to go out and win the next match. So it's a lot. And, and we've, we've seen it manifest itself, I think, most acutely in someone like Naomi Osaka, who yeah. I'll be interviewing on court should she win her match um, later tonight here at Rod Laver Arena. You know, she's, I think, the most primary tennis example of someone's world flipping upside down and having a real hard time coming to terms with it. 
So you said you got to go on and win the next match. In 91, you went on to the U.S. Open. Pete Sampras was the defending champion. Uh, many people watching this will remember that that 91 U.S. Open was also when Jimmy Connors, five-time U.S. Open champion at the age of 39 years old, came back and made it all the way to the semifinals. Sampras ran into a wall in the quarters against you. Uh, Jimmy Connors ran into a wall in the semis against you. Before we get to the end of that U.S. Oh, Open. I ran into the, the, the wall? Yeah, exactly. I was <laughs> going to say when you ran into the, to Edberg's wall, but yeah. before we get to the Edberg wall, um, yeah. talk for a moment about that semifinal match against Jimbo, because the, the, all of us who were watching at that moment, the story of Jimmy Connors qualifying and getting to the semis was just this amazing story. And then here you are, the emerging great American star. And obviously you just taken down Pete who also had won the year before. So there's this whole new cohort of up and coming Americans. You've just won the French. You're playing uh, Jimmy Connors in the semifinals and you beat him. I can't imagine what the, I mean, it must've been a wild atmosphere at stadium court in Flushing Meadows. And how did you keep your head about you as everyone's they should be rooting for you because you're the emerging American star who just won the French Open. But at the same time, there are a lot of people in that court who want Jimmy Connors to have another shot. Yeah, that, that was Jimmy Connors' U.S. Open. No one remembers it besides you and me that Stefan Edberg won that title. Uh, it's right. all about Jimmy, and, and rightfully so. You know, he was the lion in winter. He turned 39 during that tournament. He kept winning dramatic match after dramatic match. You know, it was amazing. It was awesome for tennis. And I didn't want to be the one to go shoot Bambi. I didn't want to be the one to kind of kill the buzz. I mean, Sean McManus and, and the, the, all the CBS team are still mad at me that I, that I, you know, stopped Jimmy from getting to the finals. That cost them probably, uh, you know, a couple of points on their quarterly earnings. But, you know, the way the way it goes is, is Jimmy had also played a lot more tennis than I had. So I knew that I had a physical edge on him. I would played him before and I'd had success against him. I was confident and I was fresh. I hadn't lost a set. But I was afraid. I was really afraid of that moment because, you know, that it, it's a 20,000 seat stadium. At that time, it was Louis Armstrong Stadium was the main court. And there were going to be 10 people cheering for me that day. And they all were in my player's box. And right. that's okay. I, I knew that. And I, that wasn't a surprise to me. But walking onto the court, you had to walk through a rope line from the locker room to get to underneath the stadium. You know, that was like, felt like I was being fed to the Lions. And then you walk onto the court. And you just got to try and keep your head together and focus on what's in front of you. And that's easier said than done. But um, my main goal in that day was to just stake an early lead and try, try and silence the crowd. And that's kind of the one beautiful thing about, you know, sports is, is if you've got, you know, a, a marauding audience there, if you're the one who's in control, they, they can motivate and they can scare you, but ultimately they can't hit the shots for Jimmy and they can't stop you from hitting yours. So I was able to kind of use all the factors of, of the, how the matchup actually worked okay for me, how I was fresher than Jimmy and take the crowd out of it a little bit early on. And that helped me get through there. But I can't tell you I wasn't more relieved than happy when that match was over. Uh, that, that's the truth is, is that for me was, was a huge relief to get through that match because you know I knew if he did get a lead, that it was going to be incredibly raucous and loud and he was going to ride the wave. I, you know, that's the one thing I also knew that if they got going, that motivated him. And if they were quiet, that might pop the balloon a little bit. And, and then ultimately I think that's what happened. So you then run into the, the Stefan Edberg buzzsaw in the finals and lose in straight sets, yeah. but then turn around what four or five months later in Australia and avenge that loss to Edberg by winning your first Australian open. Um, you've gone from, as you said, in Roland Garros, that incredible feeling, your first major, to now your second major title and beating someone who had just beaten you in the U.S. Open finals. Um, talk for a moment about what you remember about Australia and the first time winning down under. Yeah, well, I was, I was really anxious going into that match because he'd blown me out in the U.S. Open final. I, I really was just focused on, I just need to win a set here somewhere in the first couple of sets to get settled in and and to prove to him that I could stay on the court with him. And Edberg is a guy that I'd played actually quite a bit before that US Open final. My very first ATP final was in Basel, Switzerland, which is ironically where Federer is from and was a ball boy at, at a certain stage. And at that point in time, those were best of five set finals. And I beat Stefan in a in the five set or seven five in the fifth to win my first title. So I knew I could 
beat him, but he rattled me in New York and uh, in Australia. Now I, I came out with that simple mindset of let's focus, let's try and keep it simple. Let's not, let's not think too, too much about the past. Let's just try and execute our game plan and get a set, you know, in the first couple sets and then settle in and go to work. Cause I knew I was incredibly fit tends to be hot in Australia. I thought that would be an advantage for me. And ultimately I was able to kind of get into the match, sink my teeth into it and, and take him out in four sets. And, and it was incredibly satisfying. It wasn't as exhilarating though, as winning Roland Garros. It was more satisfying because of the arc of the story from New York. And at this time, Jim, there was a, a real sense that the new generation of players was coming up and that the older generation was sort of exiting at this time. So I think in that Australian Open, Lendl and McEnroe, as well as Becker, but Becker didn't retire for a while, both played. And then in the in the next Wimbledon, that was the last time that uh, Mac, as well as Connors, played in a, in a pro tournament. What was it like being part of the kind of the emerging players of, of you, Pete, and Andre, where there was this incredible cohort of former champions for the decade of the 80s that were on their way out as you all were coming in in the 90s yeah it was, it was interesting because we heard the we heard all about you know what who's next that was the story when we were teens who's next after this amazing generation with jimmy and and john and and arthur ash and stan smith we just always had major champions so they're wondering who's next and there was concern that there wouldn't be someone next and and uh pete was the second to market as far as that goes because michael chang another one of our peers was the first one of us to win a major he won roland garros at age 17 incredibly and then pete won the us open as a 19 year old so we we got an early start and then it all started sort of settled in andre um was the first of us to turn pro had the first early success he was the last of, of the, those four players to win a major but he had an incredible career winning eight in total and of course pete at 14 was the mark in our time on tour so it was in in many ways it was incredible to have that competitive structure within the united states of one upping each other and competing and pushing each other and, and being dragged along and and believing because we saw michael win a major that we were that we were close enough to do that it wasn't something that only gods could do because when you're a kid and you're watching Lendl and Mac and Connors and these guys dominate. You think that I mean that they're not mortal. They're they're living in a box in my in my you know in my house. I I don't know what they these people really exist. And then you become one of them, and you see your friends become one of them, and that that's then you realize they're just mortals who are pretty good at their job. But um, look, we we thrived on that competition, and I think we really helped each other. But you know, there's also an argument to be made that if there was just one of us that you know that there would have been benefit there too um if you were the only one you probably would have had more commercial success because it wouldn't have been divided so you know you can look at it through a lot of different lenses but i'm i'm pretty grateful that that i was a part of that group that not only included people that won majors we also had great players like todd martin who made the finals of australia and the us open and mal washington who was a wimbledon finalist and david wheaton a semi-finalist at wimbledon we had so many players up at up at the top or near it from America at that time. And it was uh, it was fun to be a part of. Were you friends with Pete and Andre at that time? So Pete and I turned pro the same day. We trained together the first couple of years on tour. We we played doubles together on tour the first couple of seasons. Andre and I always had a little bit more of a of a spicy relationship because at, at Volatari's there was that dynamic. We were living in the same room the first uh, first semester fighting for attention. Well, I was fighting for attention. Andre already had it. So right. there was always that, that dynamic. And, and it's, you know, it's interesting because Andre and I are close now. He, he's uh, he, as time passes and you evolve, you realize how much you have in common with these people in spite of your differences and all the shared experiences. But we are also part of Davis Cup teams together. We, we spent time on the bench, you know, pulling for each other as well. So it was, it was complicated uh, because you're also trying to take the most precious things away from each other in, in the big tournaments that you're all dreaming of winning. So it, it's a complicated deal, but we've, we've all come out on the other side um, pretty well, I think. Talk about that Davis Cup experience. You you won Davis Cup in 92 and 95, 95 in Russia, uh, playing them on their home court. What was it like going from being in such an individual sport to being on a team and, and, and having to work with these people who you compete with every day? Um, on the pro tour to actually being teammates? 
Davis Cup was fun. Those were some of the best weeks of, of my career. Uh, I loved the build up to it where we were just training and playing cards together at night, uh, eating all the meals together and, and vibing. I love that as much as the actual competition, although the competition was incredibly meaningful to play for the U.S., to play for your, your teammates, to play for the tennis fans. It was, I mean, what an honor to, to be a part of. But all those hidden moments where you, you're getting a little closer to the people that you're literally like trying to punch out on the court the next week. It's an like amazing dynamic. Of course, you can compare it to Ryder Cup and President's Cup in golf. But the difference in golf is that golf, they play the golf course. Yes, they play against each other on a week to week basis, but you can't play defense in golf. All you can do is go low. In tennis, what I do implicitly affects you and vice versa. Strategy matters. Defense matters. It's more akin to boxing without the blood and without the bruises in a way it's one-on-one. -on -one. So it's an interesting dynamic. I cherish those moments. I was lucky enough to be the captain of the U S team as well. So I saw it from the leadership side and trying to put those, uh, th those relationships together for the week. It's, um, it's special and nothing, there's nothing better Willie than hearing uh, an umpire say game set match United States of America. That is incredible. Uh, you got that also when you were in the Olympics in 92, but yeah. just on the, on the, on the, uh, on the Davis cup, before we move off of it, you were team captain from 2010 to 2018. Is that role, Jim, more of a coaching role or a GM role? It's an interesting combination of, of the two, because all of these players have their individual day-to-day -day coaches. So you have to work with them and you have to be in, in the loop with them all throughout the year. So you know what the players are going through. But there's the there's the coaching side of it where you're uniquely on the bench and you're coaching the players in real time while they're competing. And you've got to be able to to understand how to manage their personalities. You have to understand this is this is a management issue. You know, coaching is very much like management. You have to understand who you're talking to and how they hear things, because you could literally say the same sentence to two different players and they'll hear it very differently. So it's about understanding uh, those moments. And it took me a little bit of time to figure that piece out. Um, you know, you really have to put yourself in their shoes and try and understand their psyche, um, which is why I admire so much the, the coaches, of the, especially these big teams and how they can kind of keep people organized and focused and gelled together. Um, but I, I love the challenge. We never got there. We never made it to a final. We, we didn't quite have the horses in my time to do it. Um, but it was, it was a great experience for me. And, uh, you know, I loved every minute of it, uh, except for those, those tough handshakes at the end of the matches, when you've lost, uh, those are difficult, but you know, there's still something to that is special. You, you mentioned we didn't have the horses to get there. Um, uh, us hasn't seen an American major champion since Andy Roddick won in 2003. Yep. So we're in year 18 of a drought of an American men's major champion. Um, after so long of the U.S. dominating this sport, other than the fact that there are three people <laughs> from Spain, Switzerland, and Serbia who all are incredibly talented and have dominated the sport for the last 15 to 20 years, other than that minor point, why is it that there isn't an American at the top of the, of the rankings today? Well, I, I, we can't avoid the minor point. Um, you know, Andy Roddick won one major, and then Federer got there. And Federer stopped Andy, who probably would have won five or six in another era. Uh, but but Federer was there to block him. And you cannot uh, under underestimate how difficult it's been for anyone to break through from anywhere. You got three extraterrestrials playing at the same time with with Djokovic for <laughs> Nadal. They've been unbelievably consistent, durable, and and successful across surfaces. Uh, and then you you factor in. Um, for us in America, what I've seen, um, apart from Andy, and there, there are some exceptions, but I, I would say that generally the rule of thumb for me watching the American players uh, since you know Andy emerged is that very, very few of them do everything right. And what I mean by that is the nutrition, the, the fitness training, the uh, all the all the, the little intangibles uh, that, that may make a player, actually reach their best. Some of them are incredibly talented, but they're afraid to fail. I've seen that on multiple occasions. Some of them are, are very comfortable. They make plenty of money. They make generational wealth not being a champion. 
because there's a dearth of Americans. And if you get to be one of the top Americans, there's enough sponsorship money out there or appearance fees at some of the smaller tournaments to make you think you're incredibly successful. And, and on a scale of success in the world, generally speaking, to be 15 in the world at anything you do is amazing. It, it absolutely is. But that for me is not the goal. I mean, yeah, of course we wanna be successful, but for me, the thing that, that, that I sleep well at night on, and I think every player should aspire to is be the best you can be. Explore all the options to be the best that you can be, see where it goes. And then when, you're, when it's all said and done, if 500 in the world's the best you can be, good for you. And if it's number one in the world, even better. But for me, that's how I define success. And for too many of the American players, that's not how they've defined it. And I've had that discussion with all of them that I've been able to come into contact to. I can't tell you, Willie, how many times I've, I've been asked to speak at U.S. Tennis Association um, meetings with, with the top players. And I've given that same speech, but you've got to be willing to, to do it. And I haven't seen enough of that unfortunately. Uh, and with that, you don't give yourself a chance. Not that it would have made a difference in this era, but it will going forward. Um, and I, I, we have some green shoots right now in American men's tennis. And I'm, I'm certainly optimistic, more optimistic than I've been in a while. So you went on to defend your championship at Roland Garros. Does it, have to, does it still have to be about me? Can't we like- yeah, It does. I'm almost, I'm almost done on that because I want to I right. get some other stuff before we end it all. But so you go on to beat Corda to win your second French Open. Um, you uh, then go back to Australia and defend your title against Edberg um, and beat him again. So you now got four majors in a little less than two years. Yeah. Um, and that's the last major you win. Yes. Talk for a moment, Jim, about having been at that level where you've got such kind of, if you will, tight success. Yeah. You're, you're the number one ranked tennis player in the world. You're seemingly have this long career ahead of you of continuing to win tournaments and championships. And then that if you look back on it, you're still a pro for the next seven years before you retired um, in 2000. Um, but that was the that was the top. That was that was the where you got. Talk for a moment about what that was like once you've been there and trying to stay there or accepting that you're not going to stay at that level. Yeah. So, I mean, what I just laid out for you with Andy Roddick is by and large what I also lived. Uh, Pete Sampras was a better athlete. He was faster than me. Pete Sampras had a serve that was the best that we would see in our time. He had some assets that I didn't quite have, but Pete wasn't as organized uh, early in his career and he was he lacked consistency. Well, he got organized in the same way that Federer took a little time for him to get organized. And when Pete did, he not only pulled even, he pulled away. And there wasn't much that I was going to be able to do other than just continue to do my very best and try and get better in, in increments and see if I could you know, get there again. And unfortunately I couldn't, but I was at peace with all that because I knew every night when I went to bed that I'd done everything I could that day to be the best tennis player I could be. And I was competing hard and competing well. And, and I would get close, I, I would get to more finals. I would get to more semis and quarters and be knocking on the door, but I wouldn't break through and so be it. And that that's, you have to understand that everyone has limitations and your job is to try and overcome them as much as possible but there's a good chance even if you're the best in the world that someone out there is working hard to try and find a way to get past you and, you, and you've obviously you try and prevent that as much as you can but there's only so much one can do so i'm at peace with that others may not be and i understand that too others may have that competitive fire where they can't turn that off and say i can't stand losing and it's too much, but I was still content to, in the same way I was content when I was starting on tour and in, in my apex, which you just outlined in that little, little area where I was able to win those majors and be number one. And then the period after that, I approached it the same way at all times. Didn't have the same success after that, but that's okay. Uh, I still, if my career were a fish, I wouldn't throw it back. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Great saying. Absolutely great saying. So you retire in 2000, inducted in the Tennis Hall of Fame in 2005, and start your commentating career. Um, I know you do a ton of homework 
yeah. on the game, on the players to be as good a commentator as you are. Um, you enjoy it? I love commentating. I mean, I think most people that they're probably watching this, unless they're really diehard tennis fans, won't know that I'm a commentator because, you know, if you watch tennis as a general sports fan, you typically see it on ESPN. So I don't work for ESPN. I work for Tennis Channel in America, which covers everything but the majors. And then I work for groups like Channel 9 down here in Australia, which is like an NBC, if you will. Or I work for Amazon Prime, for example, during the US Open for the UK feed. So I'm sort of, because Johnny Mack is so great at what he does, and he's sort of occupied the center of all those great jobs in TV, there's not been space for me to be a, kind of an American commentator, if you will, but I love it. Uh, I, I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunities I've been given. Um, I just love being in the middle of the action and, and being able to watch history get made. And I get to do that as a commentator and be a part of it and and hopefully shed a little bit of light on what is going on in the court and help the, the audience see it in a different way. Uh, I, I find it incredibly interesting from uh, just a brain exercise uh, aspect because every day is different. And I'm trying to, to analyze and break down and use all the data that's now available to us to try and shed light on why something is happening. That, that's sort of the number one uh, job for me is to, to tell you why something is happening. If you happen to be watching a broadcast I'm on, uh, you can see what is happening. You see the score, you can see the players, but my job is to tell you why that's happening and, and give you some context. So I find it to be really, um, really intriguing and enjoyable. And, and it's a performance too. I like to perform. So it's another way to perform in a way. You, you're very uh, gracious in your comments about John McEnroe, who many of us who do watch tennis love to listen to Johnny Mac. But I wonder, Jim, you won Australia twice and the French twice. Johnny Mac won the Wimbledon three times and the U.S. Open twice. He won do you think, now. what, excuse me? He won the U.S. Open four times. Don't, let's you, not uh, short U.S. Open four times and then Wimbledon three times or two times? Three. Three. Okay. So, it's seven versus four. I got that. I guess my question is this. You won, if you will, of the four majors. People look at the U.S. Open and Wimbledon as the two major majors, if you will. Do you yeah, think that it changes a little bit had you won the U.S. Open and Wimbledon rather than the French and uh, the Australian as it relates to you versus Johnny Mack in the commentating world? I, I mean, look, John John retired sooner than I did. So he he staked his position and and did a great job and continues to do a great job doing it. And then there is something to uh, to once you get into a seat in television that, that it's awfully tough to uh, to get toppled if you're competent. Um, it's safer for the executives not to have any risk. And there's no risk in having John McEnroe, you know, do your broadcast in the same way that in Australia, uh, you know, I've been in this seat for 18 years, believe it or not. Um, so. You know, if, if you get in and you're competent and you don't cause the executives heartache, you, you can hold on to your seat. But there's look, I mean, winning Wimbledon, that's the granddaddy. That's like winning the Masters in golf. It just has a, a cachet that that's unlike anything else in the sport. And then if you're an American, the U.S. Open obviously has massive cachet as well. So, uh, you know, I think if you're going to rank the majors in order of importance, you go Wimbledon, U.S. Open, Roland Garros, Australia, historically. Um, but, you know, if you're from Paris, if you're from France and you win Roland Garros, that's probably more valuable, more important than than winning Wimbledon even. Right. And I guess the person who's actually, from a commentator standpoint, gone and won Wimbledon is Chris Fowler, who went from being a tennis commentator to now uh, commentating what I read in a Jason Gay article over the weekend in the Wall Street Journal called the Nick Saban Annual Invitational. Uh, oh, yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I met Chris with you down in Australia years ago, and uh, Chris, I'm surprised he's still, quite honestly, I'm surprised he's still covering tennis after all of his success with uh, college football. But he loves tennis. He's always been a, a tennis fan. Even before ESPN had the rights to tennis, he would come and watch tournaments. You know, he was the face of college game day for years, and Chris is an amazing broadcaster. He's a good friend. And, you know, the, the fact that he is involved in tennis, I think, adds a lot of credibility to ESPN's coverage. He does a, a terrific job. And obviously, he's just a he's the boss when it comes to college football for them. Right. And, uh, it's are they fun. down there or are they doing it out of a studio? Uh, up here? They're doing it. They're doing it in Connecticut. No, uh, yeah. last year they had to do it from home. And I think they've realized some serious financial savings, honestly, and, and doing it remotely. And it remains to be seen whether they'll ever um, send everyone back here. Yeah. So uh, in our few minutes that we have um, uh, to close out, Jim, um, 
So you and Susanna have two boys. Um, given you growing up in competitive tennis and seeing what it takes to, to win and seeing the kind of the perseverance to, to, to make it to the top levels, um, uh, you and your boys have fantastic genes, given that Susanna was a, a very accomplished tennis player herself. Um, any any pressure on the boys to play tennis or golf or just find their own way in, in, in athletics? Well, there's no pressure on them from our standpoint. There's opportunity. That's the way that we frame it. We, we present them options to enjoy sport and music and things that they might be interested in, like uh, monster trucks and dinosaurs. You know, we want them to have a very full uh, experience as children. Uh, and both Susanna and I had wonderful experiences through tennis. We both played a lot of junior tennis and lived that as kids. And, and I also, as we talked about earlier, played a lot of other sports. So, so our boys have tennis rackets. They do take tennis lessons. They will not listen to either parent when it comes to instruction. So we have a, a wonderful coach for them who, who teaches them once a week. Um, uh, golf, they're in golf clinics. Uh, we, they, they do some basketball with friends after school, uh, I want to introduce them to team sports as well and whatever else they're interested in our, our job. We see our job as parents is to open doors for them to, to then walk through and we'll follow them where they go. Uh, that's the way we see it. If it, if we end up on weekends at tennis tournaments, the way our parents did, uh, I'll be happy. I won't be sad if that's not the case. Um, you know, I'll be just as happy for them to find another passion, but having a passion is really a requirement in our house. So they, they're going to have to find something to commit energy to, to just to keep them out of trouble. Well, I would say, Jim, um, that doesn't surprise me that that's yours and Susanna's attitude towards your kids. And I would say from the, the documentary that was made on um, uh, Nick Volatari, um, they talk about Jimmy Courier and when you arrived there and what your attitude was like and what your personality was like. And it's a real testament to you that that attitude and personality endured throughout your fantastic career as yes, a brilliant tennis player, but at the end of it all, just an absolutely fantastic person. Um, I'm honored that you took the time to do this. I'm honored to have you as a buddy. Um, have a great time down under and I greatly, greatly appreciate you joining me today. Willie, it's been my absolute pleasure to, to be on this. Obviously, I love you, pal. And I can't believe you wasted all this time researching. You could have just picked up the phone. Really. <laughs> like, it's silly. It's just silly. Uh, please great give to see you, buddy. My best. All right. Good to see I'll you. I hope, you I'll, hopefully I'll see you in person real soon. Look forward to it. Take care, bud. All right, all right bye, bye, pal.